for the I hear, because I am an ageist. Also an anime. Anime is hella ageist. I will get on. Go west, my, my son. Oh no, those children didn't make it off. They, they got crushed by the train. Oh, that's dark game. Man. Ah, I see I am on the MST3K. The train of love. Satellite train of love. So, time for another train heist, right? Right? Heist game? Like, the heists keep getting more complicated, right? They didn't just throw away those mechanics after introducing them, right? What do you have to say? No. All right, I guess we just sort of hang out and all stand here. What am I going to say? Zana? What is any of this dialogue? Ah! I'll have to thank a man. Well, he likes porn. Thanks! I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Jeez. I guess I cannot get in any of these doors. Much like taking a train in real life, you just have to wait. But in real life, I bring a book with me. Oh, wait. I'm an idiot. I have books with me here. Okay, where were we? Mm -hmm. Oh shoot, I can't remember what chapter I was on. 12, I think? Let's see... Let's see... Chapter 12. 13th Street was a 25 minute walk downtown and 116 was in the East Village between 2nd and 3rd. There was a group of men outside 116 leaning against the parked cars with their sh shirts unbuttoned, smoking cigarettes and drinking beer from quart bottles. They were speaking Spanish. 116 was a four-story brick house which had long ago been painted yellow and from which the paint peeled in myriad patches. Next to it was a six-story, four-unit apartment building, newly done in light gray paint, with the door and window frames and the fire escapes and the railing along the front steps a bright red. The beer drinkers had a portable radio that played Spanish music very loudly. I went up the four steps to number 116 and rang the bell marked Custodian. Nothing happened. I rang it again. One of the beer drinkers said, Don't work, man. Who you want? I want the manager. Inside, knock on the first door. Thanks. In the entry was an empty bottle of Boone's Farm Apple wine and a sneaker without laces. The stairs led up against the left wall ahead of me. 
and a brief corridor went back into the building to the right of the stairs. I knocked on the first door, and a woman answered the first knock. She was tall and strongly built, olive skin and short black hair. A gray streak ran through her hair from the forehead to back. She had on a man's white shirt and cut off jeans. Her feet were bare, and her toenails were painted a dark plum color. She looked about 45. I said, My name is Spencer. I'm a private detective from Boston, and I'm looking for a girl who lived here once about eight years ago. She smiled, and her teeth were very white and even. Come in, she said. The room was large and square, and a lot of light came in through the high windows that faced out onto the street. The walls and ceiling were white, and there were red drapes at the windows and a rug on the floor. In the middle of the room stood a big, square, thick-legged wooden table with a red linoleum top, a large bowl of fruit in the center, and a high-backed wooden chair at either end. She gestured toward one of the chairs. Coffee? she said. Yes. Thank you. I sat at the table and looked about the room while she disappeared through a bead-curtained archway to make the coffee. Delicious. There's a red plush round back Victorian sofa with mahogany arms in the front of the windows and an assortment of Velasquez prints on the wall. Oh! Oops, something has happened. Final Fantasy VIII got, got bored of me. Oof. Sorry about that. <clears throat> an assortment of Velasquez prints on the wall. She came back in with a carafe of coffee and two white china mugs on a round red tray. Cream or sugar? I shook my head. She poured the coffee into the cups, gave me one, and sat down at the other end of the table. The coffee is wonderful, I said. I grind it myself, she said. My name is Rose Estrada. How can I help you? There is a very small trace of another language in her speech. I took out the picture of Linda Rabb that I had taken at her apartment. This is a recent picture of a girl named Donna Burlington. In 1966, from August to November, she lived at this address. Can you tell me anything about her? She thought aloud as she looked at the picture. 1966. My youngest would have been 10. Yes, I remember her. Donna Burlington. She came from somewhere in the Midwest. She seemed very young to be alone in New York, far from home. She was with a boy for a little while, but he didn't stay. What happened to her when she left you, do you know? No. No forwarding address? None. I remember she had no money and was behind in her rent, and I sent her down to the welfare people on 34th Street. And then one day she gave me all the back room rent in cash and moved out. Any idea where she got the money? I think she was hustling. Prostitute? She nodded. I can't be sure, but I know she was out often, and she brought men home often, and she used to spend time with a pimp named Violet. Is he still around? Oh, sure. People like Violet are around forever. Where do I find him? He's usually on 3rd Avenue, in front of the Casa Grande, near 15th. What's his full name? She shrugged. Just Violet. She said, more coffee? Thank you. I held my cup out, and she poured from the carafe. Her hands were strong and clean, the fingernails the same plum color as her toenails, no rings. Outside, I could hear the portable radio playing and occasionally the voices of the men drinking beer. She was a very small, thin little girl, Rosa Estrada said. Very scared. She didn't want to be here, but she didn't want to go home. She didn't know anything about makeup or clothes. She didn't know what to say to people. If she was turning tricks, it must have been very hard on her. I finished my coffee and stood. Thank you for the coffee and for the information, I said. Is she in trouble? No, I don't think so, I said. Nothing I can't get her out of. We shook hands and I left. The street seemed hot and noisy after Rosa Strada's apartment. I walked the half block to 3rd Avenue and turned uptown. At the corner of 14th Street, a man in a covert cloth overcoat was urinating against the brick wall of a vanity store. He was having trouble standing and lurched against the wall, holding his coat around him with one hand. Modesty, I thought. If you're going to whiz on a wall, do it with modesty. 
A few feet downstream, another man was lying on the sidewalk, knees bent, eyes closed. Drinking buddies. I looked at my watch. It was 2.30 in the afternoon. At the corner of 15th Street was a bar and a fake field stone front below a plate glass window. The entry to the left of the window was imitation oak. A small neon sign said Casa Grande, beer on draft. At the curb in front of the Casa Grande were a white continental and a maroon coup de ville with a white vinyl roof. Leaning against the coup de ville was a man who'd seen too many Superfly movies. He was a black man, probably 6'3 in his socks and about 6'7 in the open-toed red platform shoes he was wearing. He was also wearing red and black argyle socks, black knickers, and a chainmail vest. A black Three Musketeers hat with an enormous red plume was tipped forward over his eyes. Subtle. All he lacked was a sign saying, The Pimp is in! Excuse me, I said. I'm looking for Violet. The pimp looked down at me from on top of his shoes and said, Why? I was told he could give me information about a girl. Someone's talking shit to you, man. I don't know nothing about no girl. You Violet? He shrugged and looked down 3rd Avenue. I'm looking for information about a girl named Donna Burlington, I said. The Lincoln started up, backed away from the curb, you turned, and drove away. You federal? Violet said. I ain't seen you around. I'm not anything, I said. Just a guy looking to buy some information. Well, I hope you got a license for that piece on your right hip, then. Violet paid attention to detail. Okay. I took a card from my breast pocket and gave it to him. I'm a private cop from Boston. But I'm still buying information. <laughs> Boston! Violet laughed. Shit! What Donna do? Steal some beans? No. She stole some teeny bopper clothes from a lady's dress shop, and I think you're wearing some of them. Violet laughed again. Hey, man, you want to dress like one of your tight-ass honkies? He slapped one hand down on the hood of the Cadillac and whooped with laughter. Look at that little mother-loving Buster Brown suit. Shit. Tears were forming in his eyes. Look, Violet, I said. I didn't come down here to write a sonnet about your Easter bonnet. How about I buy you a beer and we talk a little? Yeah, why not, man? He said something about buying information. We went into the Casa Grande and sat at the bar. There was a Mets game on television down at the bar. The bartender, a middle-aged man in a clean white shirt who looked like Gilbert Rowland, came down and wiped the bar off in front of us. What'll it be, gentlemen? he asked, looking carefully at a spot between my head and Violet's. Two drafts, I said. Violet said, be cool, heck, he's okay. We're just talking a little business. The bartender looked at me then. Okay, Violet, he said, and drew the beers. Violet took his hat off. His head was stark bald and smooth. Heck, fizzy, heck, fizzy you for fuzz, too. I hope you don't think you're working in disguise, man. I shook my head. <laughs> you either, I said. Violet whooped again. What do you want to know, man? I took out my picture of Donna Burlington and showed it to Violet. Know her eight years younger? You mentioned buying. How much you buying for? Fifty bucks. It's not much bread, man. You don't have to work very hard for it, I said. It'll cover your next tankful in that brontosaurus out front. Violet nodded, drank half his beer, and said, Yeah, I remember Donna. Remembered her when you said her name. Tell me about her. A shit kicker, Violet said. Come from nowhere out in the woods. Real young when she worked for me. Worked for me maybe six months. How'd you meet her? Her boyfriend was pimping on my turf, man. I chased him off and she stayed with me. She have any choice? <laughs> Violet grinned. Not in this neighborhood, man. How come you remember her so well? She was white, man. Most of my chicks are black. What happened to her? Moved uptown. Fancy stuff. Appointment only. He finished the beer. The bartender brought us two more without being asked. She work on her own? No, she worked for another broad. A madame, baby. Very classy. Probably screwed only Boston dudes, dig? And again, the whooping laugh. Can you give me the name? I can get it, but that's extra. Another 50? That's cool. 
Violet got up and went to a payphone by the door. He was back in five minutes. Patricia Utley, he said. 57 East 37th Street. Thanks, Violet. I took out a $100 bill out of my wallet and handed it to me to him. If you're ever in Boston... Violet laughed again. <laughs> yeah, baby, if I ever want some beans. I finished the beer and got up. Violet turned and leaned his elbows on the bar. Hey, Spencer, he said. Utley works for very heavy people, Dig. That's okay, I said. I don't mind heavy work. Well, you built for it, I'll give you that. You walk around Utley careful, baby. This ain't Boston. Violet, I said. I'm not even sure this is even Earth. Okay. Well, we must have made it there by now. What's what's the hold up? Still love trains. Okay. Yep. So what does everybody else have to say? Now there's plenty of time to rest. Oh, I have to I have to leave Zell alone. Then only then do we do we make it. All right, great. Go west. I remember go west. East Academy Station. Wait, I have the option of not getting off. <laughs> Dalit Station. All right, I will bite. What kind of stuff is in Dalit Station? Ooh, that was a grunt. I was back attacked by that guy. Um, oh wait, no, I back attacked that guy. Well, what if I put him to sleep? Scanning him turns him around. All right. Oh no, 85 hit points, ugh. Hmm. Well, let's try doing a small attack to him. No! Zell, you killed him! You monster! Okay, I guess that's okay. Ooh, hot coffee. Hold up. Oh, the train left. <laughs> if the train is afraid of monsters. <laughs> um, shoot. Who has hot coffee? Squeon? I'll bet it's Squeon. Yes. Okay, so he learned some magic. Um, boost? Uh, how about, yeah. Refining magic from an item sounds cool. Are you still learning? Yes, you are. All right. Whoop. Um, <clears throat> man, my character is tiny like in some kind of indie game. Oh, that's the same dude. I don't know if I can do little enough damage to like not kill these guys. Maybe quizzes could do it. All right. Yes. Good work, quizzes. Card that sucker. Oh. Wait, what if it's been like totally random this entire time? So this other one is at full health. Hmm. 
I choose to believe that you have to weaken the Pokemon style, but I don't know how to verify that without lengthy experimentation. Which I guess we have time for. Let's um, cast Cure. Okay, so this is the one that's at like less than half health. Okay. Took two times to get him. One success or one failure followed by one success. Uh, we want to stock that. And this is the one that's at full health. One failure on it so far. Hmm. Like, if you, if you could just card something out the gate, then that would make it, like, trivial to defeat. Then a unit get no reward other than the card for doing so. Yeah, I'm gonna... I'm gonna back up and, and hit it again once I remember to do so. Um, let's stock that. Attack the Gizard quizzes. Okay, good. It's like just enough to not kill it. <laughs> Ooh, no more space. Okay, good. All right, get in the deck. Beautiful. Oh no, I got a screw. Oh, you guys want the, the music up? I can I can do I can pump the music. Um doo -ba -doo, because we're gonna be hearing enough of it. Yep, that is a risky boost, but I will take it. So now you're in louder music land. You know, I think I have enough of you guys, so, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> I found a forest. Hey, mushrooms. I remember you guys from the dream. Ooh, 300 hit points, jeez. All right. Whoa, he has beams? What the hell? <laughs> it's like, yo, I got rays! <laughs> its enemies are awesome. <laughs> it was actual dangerous attack. Yep, night night. Let's... Rays are too good. I think that a boosted attack this time will be about right. So yeah, that's 255 damage, 333. Okay. Good. 
And I want one more unplussed attack, which actually means that I want to stock some scans before we do this. Uh... Wow, eight scans. That is a powerful draw. Um... Maybe they are immune to sleep because they can cast it. That would make some kind of sense. Alright, let's bonk him one more time. Unplussed. Well, I guess you could also draw scans. Guard him! Yes! Ha! <laughs> You're mine! I will win many card games. Huh. Three app. Alright, well, that's all fascinating, but I think I should probably get back to, like, the correct place. Probably. Eventually. Ooh, that sounds new. Turtles! Are they scary and powerful? Let's attack one and find out. Yes! Adamantois. Hmm. Alright. Adam Ant. Boys. What do you got? Owns rare items that make it worth the effort, eh? Holy crap! 1,200. Weak against lightning and rock. Well, lightning it is. Oh, I didn't see how much damage that did. Crud. Scan him again. I need to know that number. <laughs> okay, I only did about a hundred damage. Ugh. These guys are gonna be hard. Zaga Thunder. Okay, so that's about a little under a thousand eight hundred fifty seven white wind. Oh, you have a trick, and that is rude. Holy shit. That's not how white wind works.